Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And what we're going to discuss here is what kind of America do you actually want? And this is going to involve family squabbles among the founding fathers, dirty elections, the revolution of 1800, sex scandals, the duel that changed America, and why you shouldn't go to war without an army. And we're going to follow that outline right up above. And let's go ahead and get started and dig our teeth really into early American politics. And ultimately, it comes down to this question. What kind of America do you actually want? And write that question down in your notes. What kind of America do you want? Because I'm going to give you two different places to live in. The first land is right up above me. It is a peaceful and bucolic place. It's a place of small and medium-sized farms, maybe a town here and there, no cities and not much industry. There's fields and streams and forests and wilderness. There's also acres and acres of productive farmland, ranches, horses, all that good farming stuff. But uh, there's not a lot of employment. There's not a lot of opportunity, and it's very, very peaceful. Or you can go over there to that land on your left. That is a place that is, that's a country where it's got huge cities, uh, massive amounts of commerce, industry, power, where you have massive cities, and there's an enormous amount of opportunity, but there's, there's many opportunities to succeed, but most, there's many opportunities to fail. There is this hierarchy where it gets sorted into this sort of brutal capitalist world dedicated to making money. It's a place that oozes power and strength and profit. Which country do you decide to live in? Because those countries correspond with visions from the Founding Fathers. Jefferson on one hand, Hamilton on the other. And all of this is in service to the question right up above me. What kind of America do you want? Would you prefer Hamilton's America or Jefferson's? Compare these two contrasting visions of the United States describe their role in the rise and fall of the first and second party systems. Are these perspectives valid today? How so? So in that question, you're going to take these two visions of America and you're going to see who is following these visions. Who does Andrew Jackson more eschew to Thomas Jefferson or Alexander Hamilton? Does Henry Clay follow Hamilton or does he follow Jackson? And you're going to apply Hamilton and Jefferson's perspective to the first, to the rise and the fall of the first two party systems. Because we're going to talk about politics. Politics. Why does it matter? Absolutely, why does it matter? That's an excellent question. And it matters because we live in a democratic society. We live in a society where you, as an engaged, educated citizen, you are expected to participate in politics. You're expected to vote for the president, but not just the president. You should vote in local and state elections as well, because ultimately you have to understand that a truly educated voter doesn't actually vote for a candidate. What you vote for is what kind of America those candidates are going to create. If you, you shouldn't vote for a, a president or a senator because they're on team red or because they're on team blue. You should vote for what they're going to do. You're going to vote for the type of America that they're going to create. And if you like the type of country these guys are going to create, then you should support them. And this is an idea of John Dewey, who was a 20th century American philosopher. And he wrote in this book called Democracy and Education that democracies function best when the electorate is educated. And the more educated the electorate is, the better the democracy functions. And in poorly educated democracies and poorly educated societies, the democracy doesn't function well and people don't vote for visions. They don't vote for the kind of nation they want. They just vote for the faction 
that they support. Because the people you select to, f to build the next generation of America, that's, that's the country you're going to live in in 10 or 20 years. That's the country that your children and grandchildren are going to live in. Now, there's a painting right up above us that shows Election Day 1815. We are living in the America that those voters chose 200 years ago. And basically, it comes down to this. What kind of America do you want? You shouldn't vote for a candidate. You shouldn't vote for a faction. You shouldn't vote for red faction or blue faction. You shouldn't vote for a candidate just because you want candidate X to win or candidate Y to lose. You should vote for the kind of America that you want to see created. And you should vote for, the, you should support the type of politicians that are apt to make that happen. This is how you steer the country. You're in the driver's seat. And if you can apply the visions of Hamilton and Jefferson to, you know, the first two political systems, the first, you know, 40 years of American politics, then you can do it in the 21st century. Now, uh, for ideological and practical reasons, American politics has been characterized as a struggle between two rival political parties, each attempting to implement their vision for the country. Now, there have always been a two-party system in America, but the, exactly which parties there are uh, has changed through time. You will occasionally get a third party, but third parties have generally not been successful in the United States. Generally what a third party is, is the, it's a third party that's focused on a particular issue. And then when one of the two major parties adopts that same issue, then the third party will, will be folded into one, of, into one of two. And all of American history has been traditionally organized into party systems. And the party system is the factional struggle between the two dominant political parties. And all of American history, all of modern, all of American political history from 1788 to the 21st century has been organized into six uh, party systems. Now, the first two uh, we're actually going to address in these lectures. So I'm not going to cover them here, but I will cover the rest of them. I mean, the first party system is the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. The second party system is the Democrats and the Whigs. We're going to learn all about those guys. Now, but the third party system, this is the party system that arises in the decades after the Civil War, in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. And it's generally the Bourbon Democrats in the South versus the Federal Republicans of the North. And what, what had happened is basically after the Civil War, the Bourbon Democrats make a deal with the Republicans that you let us rule the South any way you want, and we'll let you guys run the entire rest of the country. And that's the deal that they made. And they stuck stuck to it up until the Gilded Ages of the 1890s. And this was the rise of the fourth party system. And in the fourth party system, the Democrats basically represented sort of the rural countryside versus the Republicans who were more the people located in cities and associated with industry and commerce. And this is the 1890s, 1900, 1910, 1920s. And uh, that party system breaks apart in the Great Depression of the 1930s. And uh, Fra Fra Franklin Delano Roosevelt comes along and he rebuilds the fourth party system. And the fourth party system is in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And the fourth party system is basically where the Democrats represent both the urban and the rural working classes. And they're opposed to the Republicans who are kind of like the business class. In fact, people make fun of them. They often call them the country club Republicans. And then in the 1970s, the fifth party system broke apart. That old coalition by FDR fell apart and it yielded to the party system we have today, which people will call the sixth party system. In the sixth party system, you have the Democrats versus the Republicans. I'm not going to do a lot of interpretation because I don't want to get into modern politics. Because I want you to be able to do that on your own. So that's what you need to do when you start talking about modern politics. Ask yourself, what kind of America do you want? And it all really gets started with these guys. 1788, George Washington is president. And here's the first cabinet. There's five guys in this cabinet, but we're only worried about three. That is, of course, Washington himself on the far left. The young fellow standing in the middle. That is Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury. And the guy uh, to immediately to his right 
seated with the curly hair, that is the first Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson. And we're, we're, focused, we're focused on Hamilton and Jefferson. So let's actually ask who these people are. Alexander Hamilton was born in the West Indies, and he moves to the American colonies when he's quite young. He grows up on the streets of New York City, and he joins the revolution when the, re when the American Revolution comes. He joins Washington's army. And while he's in Washington's army, and he is a war hero, um, he and Washington develop this very, very close relationship. Washington is an older man without any sons. Uh, Alexander Hamilton is a younger man without a father figure. And the relationship that develops between George Washington and Alexander Hamilton is something of a father-son relationship. Many people basically talked about Alexander Hamilton as if he was the adopted son of George Washington. And of course, immediately uh, after the war, uh, Alexander Hamilton looks at the chaos of the Articles of Confederation. He gets together with John Jay and James Madison. They write the Federalist Papers. Alexander Hamilton is instrumental in organizing the Constitutional Convention. He's instrumental in getting the U.S. Constitution passed. And he's instrumental in getting George Washington on board, uh, getting him as president. And that's how he got the you know, position of the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, he basically promised Washington that he could fix the economy. And you know, he largely succeeded. He is this bona fide economic genius. But the other thing you need to remember about Alexander Hamilton is Alexander Hamilton is, is a little off. Alexander Hamilton, I, I don't what's the best way to say it? Alexander Hamilton um, almost doesn't seem to understand how normal people work sometimes. And that works dramatically against his favor, as we shall see. This is Hamilton's broad, great sweeping vision of America. Hamilton views an America that is a, that is a nation with a very strong central government, the central government which is far stronger than any of the states. He views an America that features commerce and wealth, and all of this is regulated by a strong central bank. He embraces the concept of capitalism, commerce, enterprise, and he thinks this is going to sort American society into a country where your status isn't determined by birth, but it becomes a hierarchy of merit. It's whether you can cut it in the free market or you can't. And in this, he's strongly influenced by a book which is published in 1776 called Adam Smith's Inquiry into the Wealth of Nations. And what Adam Smith argues in The Wealth of Nations is that the true wealth of nations doesn't come from, you know, gold or silver that you dig out of the ground. It doesn't come from wheat or tobacco or cotton that you grow. The wealth of nations comes from commercial activity. The, the buying and selling of goods, this creates wealth. And the bigger and the stronger the market, the wealthier the society and the stronger and more powerful the nation. And Hamilton is into the wealth of nations. And even though Adam Smith doesn't use the term capitalism, wealth of nations is often seen as one of the first great works arguing for a commercial capitalist economy. And Hamilton is a convert. And he views America as a nation of big cities and industry. And this is helped with protective tariffs, holding off foreign goods, while America makes everything it needs itself. He, vis he has this vision of America as the United States as a great power in the world, with a strong army, a powerful navy, able to keep enemies far away, and able to export these great American ideas across the globe. It is Hamilton's vision of a country of cities and commerce and a hierarchy of nations. And if you picked that option when you talked about what kind of country you lived in, then Alexander Hamilton's vision is close to your own. Who is Thomas Jefferson? We've met Thomas Jefferson before. Thomas Jefferson was born into a prominent Virginia family, a planter family, and then he married into a very wealthy family, the Wales family, and became uh, 
really tied into the first families of Virginia. And if Thomas Jefferson is anything, he's about as close to American aristocracy as you can get. Yet it was these ideas of aristocracy that he just completely discards. He embraces these radical French ideas of equality, fraternity, where every man is, all men are created equal. And Thomas Jefferson, of course, writes the Declaration of Independence. He spends much of the American Revolution uh, in France, organizing aid. He becomes very strongly influenced by French politics and especially by the French Revolution. And he has a complete loathing of English ways of doing things. And he embraces a kind of Republican simplicity of, of thought and of speech and of dress. Simple is best, humble is even better. And Alec, Thomas Jefferson's version of America is basically this. It's that first description of a country that I described to you. Thomas Jefferson views an America made up of small and medium-sized farms spread out like a quilt. And there might be a big city or two, but they're not that important. Jefferson does not want the federal government to, very, be, to be very strong. In fact, Jefferson argues that there should be a very weak central government, one that is much less powerful than the states. He argues for a nation of rural farmers and agriculture, every man owning his own property, paying rent to no other man, growing all of his own food, independent stockholders, strong, doughty farmers, selling their produce to the world. This is an embrace of pastoralism, a love of the countryside, where a, a, an America filled with streams and rivers and forests, where you, know, you don't have to drive outside of a city for an hour to see wilderness. Uh, simple living where everyone is equal. All people are equal on the countryside. The, and in this, um, Jefferson is strongly influenced by a book by a French philosopher called Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And uh, there is one of his more famous works called The Social Contract. And what Jean-Jacques Rousseau argues is that all people are born good. All people are inherently good, but they are corrupted by the vices and the riches and the money of society. Men are turned on each other by the wickedness of society. And the closer you are to, the, to nature and the closer you are to the, soil, to the soil, the better and the more moral person you become. And this is what Jefferson believes. He thinks a nation of small and medium-sized farms is a more moral and upstanding nation. And to do that, weak central government and power distributed widely. He believes that each state should control its own finances. There should not be a central bank controlling currency or controlling interest. And finally, Thomas Jefferson does not believe in any type of foreign intervention. He says America should be a country that leaves the rest of the world alone. There's no need for a military. There's no need for a navy. We're not ever going to attack anyone. And if we are attacked, we have a nation of strong, well-fed, moral farmers that will rise up and defend America if necessary. This is Jefferson's version of America. Now, in 1788, they are all Federalists because they were all supporting the new Constitution. But once they get into power, things change quite dramatically. Hamilton begins to rebuild the economy, but Hamilton's building the economy in such a way that aligns with Hamilton's vision of how America could be, how America should be. And this alarms Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson is alarmed by Hamilton's acts, uh, supporting businesses, taxing everything that moved, favoring the cities over the countryside, supporting the British, and, and Hamilton is a big admirer of the British. Hamilton actually wants America to be just a better, more improved version of Great Britain. Whereas Thomas Jefferson is like, no, we fought a revolution to get rid of all that British crap. We don't want to rebuild a British system. To do this, Jefferson opposes Hamilton's acts inside the Washington cabinet, but often he gets overridden by Washington, who favors Hamilton. 
So what Jefferson starts to do is undermine Hamilton's actions at every time he can. Hamilton wants to build a bank. Jefferson torpedoes that idea again and again and again. The eight years of Washington's presidency rapidly devolve into a series of ugly squabbles between Jefferson arguing with Hamilton and Hamilton arguing with Jefferson. The two men grow to hate one another intensely, which leads to that absolutely wonderful Alexander Hamilton quote right up above, in which he says, <clears throat> this is founding father stuff, there are approximately 1,010,300 words in the English language, but I could never string enough words together to properly explain how much I want to hit you with a chair. <clears throat> Alexander Hamilton to Thomas Jefferson. Here's an example. This is a, an example of an important squabble between the two men, and it has to do with financing the government and financing debt. During the American Revolution, all of these states had racked up enormous debts to, to fight the revolution, but not every state had the same level of debt. Some states like Massachusetts or New York had really staggering debts, while other states like South Carolina or Virginia didn't really owe much money at all or had paid off a lot of their war debts. So Hamilton wants the federal government to assume the debts of all the states. That way all the states can start with a clean slate and the federal government sucks up all of the debt and it's going to manage all of the debt from the revolution. After all, it was the revolution itself that created the federal government. And Jefferson hates this idea because to do that, you need a central bank. And he torpedoes the idea again and again and again and again. And he gets, um, he gets James Madison to help him on this and they consistently block Hamilton's idea for debt relief for the states and the creation of a central bank. And eventually things get so bad that they literally retire to a private dinner room to basically horse trade on how each side can get exactly what they want. And Hamilton comes up with a deal that's gonna make James Madison and Thomas Jefferson happy, and it's gonna get what Alexander Hamilton wants too. So Hamilton proposes Basically, a four-point plan. Uh, this Hamilton gets two of the things he wants. Jefferson and Madison get two of the things they want. And this is called the Compromise of 1790. This is what Hamilton says. One, that they're going to agree to Hamilton's plan of debt relief. All of the state debts are going to be folded onto the federal government. It's gonna, going to become a federal debt. And that way, all the states can start with blank slates. To do that, you need a central bank. So Jefferson and Madison will help Hamilton in the creation of the first bank of the United States. And there's a drawing of it right there. Those are the two things Hamilton gets. In return, he offers, well, he offers two things to Jefferson. One of them is very, very big and something that Jefferson loves. The other thing Jefferson will take. The little thing is he will accept a very weak central bank. Um, that's the first thing that Jefferson gets, that Jefferson gets really, really hard limits on the power of the first bank of the United States. It is really limited as, as to what it can do. It's basically limited to a few things with high currencies and debt relief, and that's, that's almost it. But the other thing that Hamilton offers Jefferson that Jefferson really likes is the idea for a new city. They're going to create a new federal capital that will be called Washington, D.C. And it's going to be placed in the South between the Southern states of Maryland and Virginia. So the federal capital will be a Southern capital. Jefferson and Madison agree to this. They all shake hands. They agree the first bank of the United States is chartered in 1791. There's even a good musical number in the musical Hamilton about this meeting. It's called The Room Where It Happened. Uh, so everybody's happy. Not super happy, but they're satisfied as to what they got. Um, but that's very rare. Most of the time, Jefferson and Hamilton just argue back and forth. And Washington absolutely hates this. Washington is increasingly angry at both Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. 
even though he consistently favors Hamilton over Jefferson, Jefferson is his friend, but Hamilton is, is kind of his adopted son. Uh, Jefferson loses, starts losing these fights on a regular basis. Jefferson gets very disenchanted with the government. Hamilton kind of lords these victories over Jefferson. Um, a national army is created. And Jefferson basically says, okay, I, I'm going to finish out as Secretary of State for your first term, uh, Mr. Washington, but I'm not going to come back for the second. And George Washington basically says, look, we really need you, Thomas Jefferson. Why don't you come back for my second term, but as my vice president? Because vice presidents don't do much. And Jefferson very reluctantly agrees. So Hamilton and Washington sideline Thomas Jefferson, and they're able to really get in to this program, this Federalist program, and Hamilton's version of America starts to be implemented. Jefferson is, is very demoralized about this, and James Madison is not very happy about this. And there's a lot of people that are very disenchanted with the Federalists, and they don't like what Hamilton is doing, and they don't like that Washington is just giving okay to whatever Hamilton wants. Jefferson eventually leaves the capital of Philadelphia, he goes south, and between him and Madison, they start building their own political party. And uh, Washington's second term ends in 1796. Washington is quite old. Um, he's lost all his teeth. He only has one tooth left. Uh, that's why if you ever look at these paintings of, of like Washington in his mouth, he looks like he's like unhappy and his mouth is all swollen. Uh, that's because his, he was on, almost in almost constant pain from his teeth. At any rate, uh, Washington is in Ill, Ill health. He opts not to run for third term as presidency, and he issues a farewell address, addressing what he thinks is the greatest problem facing the country. Is it Native Americans? No. Is it the British? No. Is it the economy? No. Washington says the greatest danger to the United States is political parties, vicious factional struggles. And he writes in his farewell address, the words up above me, the alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to party dissension, which in different ages and countries has perpetuated the most horrid enormities, is itself a frightful despotism. So when people vote for factions instead of candidates or teams or tribes instead of ideas, this diminishes democracy, it diminishes the country. But there's more, let's keep going with Washington. But this leads at length to a more formal and permanent despotism. The disorders and miseries which result gradually incline the minds of men to seek security and repose in the absolute power of an individual. And sooner or later, the chief of some prevailing faction, more or more able or more fortunate than his competitors, turns this disposition to the purposes of his own elevation on the ruins of public liberty. Political parties, according to George Washington, eventually end in the fall of democracy. When, when loyalty to one team or loyalty to your political tribe become more important than love of country and faithfulness to democracy. The real threat to America from George Washington is politics, political parties which turn into factions and people not thinking when they vote, but trusting their gut, not their heart or their head. Washington dies in 1799 and his warning is only partially heeded. And the thing about Washington's death is, you know, with Washington dead in 1799, there are no more limits on the factional fighting that's going to descend between Jefferson and Hamilton. I mean, dad is gone, and the boys are going to fight in the living room. And this leads to the creation of the first party system, where you have the Federalist versus the Democratic Republicans. You can see in the political cartoon above me, uh, there is uh, the Federalists pulling on one pillar of liberty, uh, the, the Democratic Republicans pulling on the other, and the whole edifice of America is about to collapse while George Washington looks down from a cloud and tells them that they're going to destroy the nation. 
And the leader of the Federalists, well, the Federalists don't have a single leader. They have two leaders, which is Alexander Hamilton and John Adams. And Alexander Hamilton and John Adams do not like one another. Uh, Hamilton might be Washington's adopted son, but John Adams is the person that Washington selected uh, to be his successor president. Adams is president from 1796 to 1800. But opposing the Federalists are the Democratic Republicans. This is the political party that Thomas Jefferson and James Madison build once they've been kind of forced out of the Federalists. And it's led by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. But Thomas Jefferson is very much the senior partner in this. While with the Federalists, Adams and Hamilton don't like each other, but they dislike Thomas Jefferson even more. So let's look at actually what these parties are arguing for. It's not just Team Red or Team Blue. Both parties have a radically different program that they want to create inside the United States in terms of a national army, a central bank, uh, expansion, or you know the internal works or not. So you have the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, the national army. The Federalists are like, yes, we absolutely should have a federal uh, should have a federal army to be able to defend the nation and a federal navy capable of patrolling our waters. Thomas Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans think uh, absolutely not. Um, the if if we have a central army, then the government is necessarily going to use it to threaten the states or even possibly use it to subdue rebellious states. Thomas Jefferson is absolutely opposed to an American army. How about in terms of foreign policy? The Federalists are very pro-British. They just want to, they want to rebuild the British system in America, just do it better. And this is completely opposed to the Democratic Republicans. They are very pro-French. They, they do not like the British system. We had a revolution to get rid of that. They want to build a model more on the model of the French Revolution, of egality, of equality, of fraternity, where every person is equal. Well, central bank, the Bank of the United States. The Federalists are very much, in, very much in favor of the Bank of the United States. Using the Bank of the United States, they can build these big cities. They can build all this commerce. They can build the industry required to turn the United States into this economic superpower. To the Democratic Republicans, the Bank of the United States is an awful thing. And the Bank of the United States is just going to create a moneyed interest where you have a few super rich people that then manipulate financial rules to make themselves richer while making everyone else poorer. Alexander Hamilton says, of course, that would never happen. Now, in terms of slavery, the Federalists do not care. The Federalists have no opinion about slavery whatsoever. They just don't care. Uh, now, the, the Democratic Republicans are both yes and no about slavery. It's not a big issue. It's certainly not the scale of the issue it will come later. But to the Democratic Republicans, they are not, they, they don't like slavery. They uh, are not comfortable with slavery, but they never make any moves to abolish slavery. They do uh, limit the transport of slaves. They do outlaw, or they eventually will outlaw the importation of more African slaves. But for the most part, while they don't like slavery, they make no moves against it. So the Democratic Republicans are kind of iffy about slavery. Territorial expansion. Should the country grow? The Federalists say, no, not really. I mean, the country is always already between the Atlantic Ocean and the Mississippi River. The country's huge. We should work on improving the country we have long before we start dreaming about acquiring new territory. But the Democratic Republicans are into expanding the United States. They think the idea of getting more territories, acquiring more states, more territory is good and natural. And there's a reason for this. Remember, Thomas Jefferson wants an America that's made up of small and medium-sized farms. Well, if you're going to have small and medium-sized farms, you're going to run out of land very, very quickly. And as your population increases, necessarily your territory must increase as well. Finally, there's regional differences. The Federalists are basically based out of New England, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire. While the Democratic Republicans are basically based in the South, Virginia, the Carolinas, and these new Western states of Kentucky and Tennessee. And all of this comes to a head in the election of 1800. 
in which Thomas Jefferson runs against John Adams, his old friend from back in the days of the revolution. And it is an intensely ugly election. It is a very ugly election, both the election of 1800 and Jefferson's re-election in 1804. These are really, really ugly, ugly elections. It's ugly as it gets. Uh, Thomas Jefferson insinuates that uh, John Adams is incompetent. He's doddering. He's old and fat and useless. Um, he's really a secret Englishman who wants to deliver the country back to the British. John Adams counters with saying that Thomas Jefferson is a dangerous atheist who wants to, if you look at that cartoon, a uh, second from the left, where he wants to burn the constitution on the fires of the French revolution. And in the cartoon, the uh, American Eagle is preventing Thomas Jefferson from burning the laws of the country. Uh, but the insults get really, really low. Uh, and if, <laughs> I mean, there is, uh, if you look at the chickens on the upper left, right up there, you'll see that's a parody of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson as the philosophical cock. And yes, they, they, they're, they're meaning something more than a rooster. And, you know, he, that's, why they, that's why he's got a scrotum on his chin. And uh, they begin to talk openly about how this philosophical cock struts, or, struts around, hangs out with a woman named Dusky Sally, and everyone knows that the philosophical cock prefers the black hens. Ugly. The relationship between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson is destroyed. It is absolutely ruined. And one of the people that intervenes in this is Alexander Hamilton. Now, Hamilton sits out the election of 1800. And Alexander Hamilton sits out the, ele the election of 1800 because he gets wrapped up in the first sex scandal in American history. This is called the Reynolds Affair. I kind of have to decide, like, like, should I keep it PG or go all the way to R in terms of the Reynolds Affair? All right, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and keep it pretty... PG or PG-13. Okay, Alexander Hamilton is married. He has he and his wife have seven kids. Um, however, um, Alexander Hamilton begins this torrid affair uh, in the 1790s with his next door neighbor, this 23-year-old uh, woman who's very beautiful, and her name is Maria Reynolds. And uh, <laughs> uh, Alexander Hamilton will come home from the Department of the Treasury, have dinner with his wife, say he's got to have late work back at the Treasury, and then literally just walk next door uh, and, and spend the evening with Maria Reynolds. And once they have finished, then he'll go back and sleep with his wife. Uh, and they're into this affair. And then, a couple years into this affair, uh, Alexander Hamilton figures out that Maria Reynolds is actually married and uh, they're caught by her husband. And her husband is outraged at Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and Alexander Hamilton offers a very, a solution that's very Alexander Hamilton. Alex, Alex, the normal thing to do is to, ch to fight or to challenge the guy to a duel. But Alexander Hamilton says, uh, there's no reason we need to duel. Um, how about if I just pay you off? And uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Reynolds, uh, Maria's Maria's husband, um, he owes a lot. He owes a lot of low people a lot of money, so he basically agrees. And Hamilton and Mr. Reynolds come to this agreement, where Alexander Hamilton, <laughs> where Alexander Hamilton, pays Maria's husband to have sex next door to his wife. Uh, and they do this for years uh, until eventually they're caught. And uh, they're caught because uh, Hamilton is accused of embezzling from the Treasury because he's been making these large cash payments to Mr. Reynolds. And Mr. Reynolds, like, keeps his mouth shut because he wants the gravy train to keep rolling. And he's <laughs> spiffing out his wife uh, to the Secretary of the Treasury. And... Um, 
rather than be accused of embezzlement, uh, Alexander Hamilton basically just publicly admits to the affair. And he basically publicly admits uh, to this very, very strange relationship. Uh, he ruins his, ruins his own marriage. And he has to resign uh, uh, from politics. And like, the, I mean, in the 21st century, that would be a very strange sex scandal for the 21st century. Not to mention, you know, 1797. So Hamilton is out of politics. Uh, Hamilton's, you know, they basically, the Federalists tell Hamilton, look, look, man, uh, you got to go away until people forget about this very strange thing you did. And Hamilton shrugs and agrees. He's like, why not? Um, but during this, the ugly election of 1800, a, a lot of Federalists ask Alexander Hamilton, what exactly is his opinion of John Adams? Alexander Hamilton, again, he's, he's a very odd guy. Uh, Alexander Hamilton just says, you know, look, uh, John Adams is not a very smart man. He's not a very honest man. Um, the only reason Washington picked him is, you know, because I, he doesn't think that I was old enough. Um, and he just thought he would be not something to be nice and safe. And they don't really trust Thomas Jefferson, you know, who's practically a French loving atheist. Uh, and we don't know if, if Hamilton wanted these letters to get out or be published or not, or that he thought they would be private letters. But at any rate, they these letters of, of Hamilton circulate. And that's the nail in the coffin for the presidency of, of John Adams. Adams never forgives the Federalists. He never forgives um, Alexander Hamilton. And he basically just storms up back off to Boston uh, to basically devote all his energies into raising his son, who will grow up to become John Quincy Adams. Remember that name. So uh, Thomas Jefferson is elected president in 1800, and it's called the Revolution of 1800. The Democratic Republicans have overturned Federalist rule. We're going we're gonna to turn back the clock on all these crazy ideas that Hamilton had, uh, and we're going to create a nation of farmers who own their own land and have access to nature. And then the Federalists try to steal the election from Thomas Jefferson. And they try to steal the election from Thomas Jefferson through a loophole in the Constitution. The Constitution said that the person will become president who has the highest number of electoral votes. And the person who has the second highest number of electoral votes will become vice president. They, they close this loophole later on. So this problem's never happened again. So Thomas Jefferson becomes, uh, pre he, he has the highest number of electoral votes, but the guy who was running as his vice president is this fellow named Aaron Burr. And uh, Thomas Jefferson is expecting to become president and Aaron Burr is expecting to become vice president. Now, Aaron Burr is, is very, very bright. He's very, very ambitious, but he's, he's a little nutty. And the Federalists come to Aaron Burr and they see Aaron Burr as a way of finally stopping Thomas Jefferson from becoming president. And they say, look, technically you have the same number of electoral votes. So technically you could be president. And Aaron Burr is like, I could be president. And the Federalists still, well, well, the Federalists tell him all it involves is stabbing your boss in the back and challenging Jefferson in court. And Aaron Burr goes, I'll do it. And this gets thrown into Congress, exactly who is president. And Thomas Jefferson is, is, is flabbergasted. He's like, what, what are you talking about? I won the election. People voted for Thomas Jefferson. Nobody voted for Aaron Burr. All right, I, I wrote the declaration, for goodness sakes. And the Federalists are using this as a spoiler to, to ruin Jefferson's presidency, because it's forcing him to ruin his own vice president. And this goes on again until Alexander Hamilton intervenes. Alexander Hamilton is still on the sidelines waiting for people to forget about the Reynolds affair. So uh, Hamilton writes a series of letters to the other Federalists. And this is what Hamilton says. Hamilton says, look, look, guys, look, I don't like Thomas Jefferson any more than you do. You guys do. Thomas Jefferson has kooky ideas that he picked up from the French. Uh, and he's bad for the country. But look, he won fair and square. 
nobody gives a long, wet fart about Aaron Burr. Thomas Jefferson is president. And working behind the scenes, Hamilton collapses this ability, this, this attempt by Aaron Burr to steal the presidency. And of course, this ruins the relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. And basically, at the soonest opportunity in 1804, uh, Jefferson basically kicks Aaron Burr out of the party. Uh, and Aaron Burr goes back to the Federalists and he goes, look, guys, you, you encouraged me to stab my boss in the back. You, you have to give me something. And the Federalists say, OK, um, let's see if we can get your position in New York. Uh, hey, we can, we can, maybe we can get you to run for governor of New York. And Aaron Burr is getting ready to run for the governor of New York when again Alexander Hamilton intervenes. Alexander Hamilton writes a series of letters to the other Federalists. And he's like, look, look, look. Forget about Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr is this weird guy. He's mentally unstable. He's been kicked out of the Democratic Republicans. We do not need him in the Federalist Party. And Hamilton's Hamilton's arguments sway the Federalists. And Aaron Burr is kicked out of the Federalist Party. He's been kicked out of two political parties. And Aaron Burr finds out about this and publicly challenges Alexander Hamilton to a duel. And Alexander Hamilton is like, look, look, yeah, I'll fight you in a duel if you really want. But look, this is just a point of honor. Uh, it doesn't really mean that much. I, I don't have anything against you. Hamilton says, look, I don't have anything against you, Aaron Burr. You just don't need to be in politics. But Hamilton's friends are like, look, man, Burr is dangerous. And Hamilton is like, no, Burr is not dangerous. It would, it would, it would destroy Aaron Burr's life if he was to actually shoot me. Surely no one is that crazy. So they meet for a duel. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, they walk 20 paces apart. Alexander Hamilton takes out his pistol, fires it into a nearby tree, pop. Knocks, shoots a branch off, actually. And uh, basically says, look, honor has been satisfied. Are, are you okay with this, Aaron? You know, we, we don't need to do anything else. Uh, and Aaron Burr goes, uh, no, I, I think we need to do that. And Aaron Burr shoots Alexander Hamilton in the spine. Uh, Ale Alexander Hamilton dies the next day in excruciating agony. And Aaron Burr's friends come to him and they're like, dude, you have got to get out of town. And Aaron Burr goes, but the duel was completely legal. Uh, but it doesn't matter. You just shot George Washington's adopted son. And Aaron Burr's like, oh. And then the, the enormity of what he just did sank in. And Aaron Burr takes off. Uh, he flees to Tennessee, where, where he meets, interestingly enough, he spends a couple days at the estate of a young up-and-coming planter in Tennessee named Andrew Jackson. Remember that. And Aaron Burr ends up down in New Orleans and he's involved in some weird shenanigans with like the Spanish Empire and the Mexican rebels. And it's all very strange. But it doesn't matter because he's never uh, allowed to get very far because of all people, the person that takes it upon himself to avenge Alexander Hamilton is Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson sends federal marshals after Aaron Burr. They arrest him down in New Orleans. They drag him all the way back to Washington. They put him on trial for treason. And Thomas Jefferson says, we demands that they seek the death penalty for Aaron Burr. And Aaron Burr is completely flabbergasted. I mean, he was an old Democratic Republican back in the election of 1800. And Aaron Burr is like, why are you mad at me? You know, you... You hated Alexander Hamilton. And Thomas Jefferson is like, no, no. Hamilton was my friend. And we disagreed very, very strongly on things. But we were never enemies. He was my opponent, not my enemy. And Aaron Burr is put on trial for treason, uh, but of course, it's ridiculous. The duel was legal. They could never exactly figure out what these weird, sh weird political shenanigans were down in New Orleans. 
and Aaron Burr is found not guilty, but is strongly urged by everyone who knows him. You, dude, you've got to get out of the country. And the rest of Aaron Burr's life is completely and totally ruined. He has to spend a few years in exile and poverty in England. Uh, he eventually does sneak back into the United States. He has to change his name and live anonymously. And it ruined his life. And Aaron Burr has gone down in American history as, you know, the guy who murdered Alexander Hamilton. It's very sad in the musical. Now, there's other things going on that, that Thomas Jefferson has bigger, bigger things to worry about than, than you know, his political uh, opponent being murdered in New York. Uh, because Europe is completely exploded. Uh, that the United States might be at peace, uh, well, with the exception of Aaron Burr and, and, and Alexander Hamilton. But Europe itself is in the process of blowing itself up because Europe has just launched a series of colossal military wars called the Napoleonic Wars. And they're triggered by the French Revolution, the rise of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, and the clash of these colossal armies all the way from Spain to Moscow, from Scotland to Egypt. These, these colossal armies are on the move. I mean, at one point in time, the French army, the Grand Army is half a million men and stretches like across Eastern Europe in a huge line, massive wars. And even though, um, uh, even though Thomas Jefferson favors the French, he does not want to get the United States involved in this. When you've got these two titans that are just bashing each other to death, the French and the English are locked into this life or death struggle across the world. The United States is not getting involved in that. And this, of course, aligns with Jefferson's principles. The United States should stand alone and apart from any other country. But he does kind of secretly hope the French win. Napoleon Bonaparte is actually quite fond of the United States. Um, you know, the, in popular literature, he's portrayed as like a really, really short guy, but he was actually of average stature. And at one point in time during, during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the French invade Spain and they just like crush uh, the kingdom of Spain. And they rebuild the kingdom of Spain. And one of the things Spain offers Napoleon is a lot of these old French colonies in the New World, including New Orleans and Louisiana. And there is a brief period of time where Napoleon kind of imagines having this French empire in the New World, but it's really not an issue. Uh, I mean, he's got his hands full, you know, in Europe fighting half of, you know, fighting half of the continent. So uh, Thomas Jefferson wants New Orleans. So when uh, Thomas Jefferson sends envoys to Napoleon Bonaparte in an attempt to purchase New Orleans, uh, Napoleon offers them all of the entire colony of Louisiana, which was all in green. It's the entire drainages of the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers, a massive area that would double the size of the United States. Napoleon's price is $15 million in gold. And by the way, that works out to three cents an acre. And Thomas Jefferson is into an expansionistic country anyway. He leaps at the chance. He actually asks uh, Napoleon, well, we're about to give you $15 million worth of gold. Um, what are you going to use this money for? And Napoleon says, oh, we're going to use it to invade England. So Jefferson is all for it at that point. Um, and uh, he sends, uh, Jefferson sends, wait, there's there's two ironies about this that I forgot. One is the person that, en that raised all that money to begin with all of that $15 million was raised by Alexander Hamilton uh, back when he was the Secretary of the Treasury. And the only financial institution that could even handle that kind of money is the First Bank of the United States. So Thomas Jefferson has to use this bank that he hates to buy the land he wants to help the French that he likes. And to explore this new Louisiana purchase, he sends... Uh, a pair of explorers, Lewis and Clark, to explore the areas. And with the help of their uh, Indian ally, Sacagawea, they go all the way from St. Louis to the Pacific 
ocean, exploring all of this new country, because Thomas Jefferson has just doubled the size of the United States. But Thomas Jefferson still wants to keep the United States out of the Napoleonic Wars. He bends over backwards to prevent the United States in, from getting into the war. And both sides, both the English and, and both the British and the French are very unhappy with the United States because both either wants them, wants the United States to come in and help them, help them fight the wars. Thomas Jefferson won't do it. The British continually threaten the United States because one of the things the United States keeps doing is the United States lets it be known that if a, any British sailor or soldier deserts and you can make it to the United States, we'll make you an American citizen and therefore uh, you can't be tried for desertion. Um, and uh, the British continually threaten the United States, either help us in the war or quit trading with France or we will declare war on you. Thomas Jefferson gets the same from the French. The French are continually threatening and offering all of these things to the Americans if the Americans will fight on the side of France. And as you can see in the political cartoon to the left, you can see literally uh, that's King George, uh, King George IV. That's King George, John Bull in red, for threatening Thomas Jefferson on one side with a tiny little Napoleon pulling money out of his pockets on the other. And Thomas Jefferson is a skilled enough politician to keep America out of the war. And he succeeds, but he succeeds in having these really, he succeeds in a really, really dramatic way. In 1807, uh, Thomas Jefferson passes the Embargo Act. And the point of the Embargo Act is to prevent any favoritism between France and Britain. What Thomas Jefferson says is, okay, the French get mad at us when we trade with the British. The British get mad at us when we trade with the French. So what we're going to do is pass this huge embargo and we're not going to trade with anyone. Okay? But the Embargo Act has no real teeth. Uh, and as you can see from, from up above, the embargo is, is portrayed as a turtle because it's like so slow, it can't really be enforced. And it's biting that smuggler on the ass. He says, oh, that cursed, oh, grab me because that's embargo backwards. You couldn't figure it out. And the Embargo Act is, is a disaster. Um, it triggers this economic depression in the United States. It triggers an economic panic. Ships and businesses start going out of, start losing customers. They go out of business. Farms go bankrupt. Banks start to fold. And they all blame Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas, they will not listen to Thomas Jefferson's arguments. And Thomas Jefferson says, hey, look, it's either the Embargo Act or we're going to war. No one will listen to his arguments. He gets routinely blamed uh, for the economic downturn in America. And he decides Thomas Jefferson is sick and tired of being president. He's exhausted. He really just wants to go back to Monticello and help build this thing he's heard of called the University of Virginia. Thomas Jefferson says, you know what? Washington followed a good rule, two terms and then you quit. So Jefferson decides to do the same thing. He decides to not run for re-election in 1808, pass the baton of the presidency to his good friend, James Madison, and retire to Monticello. There's an election in 1808, but the Federalists, without Alexander Hamilton, without John Adams, there is no real competition. President Madison, James Madison is elected president in 1808, and he will be president for the next eight years. Again, like Jefferson and Washington, serving two terms. He appoints as his Secretary of State, James Monroe. And I'm pointing this out because at this point, it's becoming custom. It's becoming the custom to name your successor as your Secretary of State. So um, Washington's Secretary of State was Jefferson. Jefferson became president. Jefferson's Secretary of State was James Madison. Madison became president. Uh, Madison's Secretary of State is James Monroe, and Monroe will eventually become president. It's the Secretary of State that's more, actually more powerful than the Vice President at this point. And James Madison uh, uh, takes over from Thomas Jefferson. Uh, now, the first bank of the United States, the bank that they originally created back in the Compromise of 1790, uh, its charter expires in 1811. And James uh, Madison has the option of either renewing the charter 
or just letting the bank die on its own. And he's a Democratic Republican. They hate the banks. So he lets the first bank of the United States die. And we go back to these small regional state banks. Madison could not have been happier. But Madison is not the diplomat that Jefferson was. Jefferson was very, very careful to keep the United States out of the Napoleonic Wars. Madison doesn't have that level of skill. And as tensions rise between Britain and the United States, James Madison makes the decision that there's been enough standing on the sidelines. We're not going to ruin our economy recreating a silly thing like the Embargo Act. You know, if, if the British want to fight, then we will fight the British. We beat them back in the 1770s. We can beat them today. And the British, unimpressed, uh, continue this policy of searching American vessels for deserters, searching American ves uh, vessels for, for what they view as goods being smuggled into Europe. And James Madison declares this to be a stain on the country's honor. He goes to Congress and asks for a declaration of war. And there's the uh, political cartoon you can see on the left. There's James Madison. He's got his dukes up, and he's given old King George a bloody nose. They're thinking, we beat these guys back in the 1770s. We're going to beat them in the 1810s. Uh, there's, there's just two problems with this. James Madison has no army. There is no American army. I mean, Hamilton wanted to make an army back in the 1790s. Jefferson got rid of that. And there, Madison had never felt the need to build a national army. And two, there's no bank. Where would you get the money to even build an army in the first place? So James Madison is about to go to war with one of the most militarily powerful nations on earth with no army and no bank, no plan, and no real luck, and very bad things are about to happen. And those are the type of things that we'll look into next time, and I will see you there.